Today is May 16th, 2024, and my guest is political thinker and author Yuval Levin. He is the Director of Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies at the American Enterprise Institute, where, where he also holds the Beth and Ravenel Curry Chair in Public Policy. He's the founder and editor of National Affairs, senior editor at the New Atlantis, contributing editor at National Review, and a contributing opinion writer at the New York Times. This is Yuval's fourth appearance on Econ Talk. He was last year in March of 2020 discussing his book, A Time to Build. Our topic for today is his newest book, American Covenant, How the Constitution Unified Our Nation and Could Again. Yuval, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thanks so much for having me, Russ. What are you trying to achieve with this book? It's a very ambitious book about, at a very, uh, I'd say, sophisticated level of thinking, about the role of the Constitution in, her, in the founding of the United States and then the role it could play today. What are you trying to achieve? Well, you know, this book is a reintroduction to the Constitution for Americans who know it. And a lot of Americans, you know, if you follow the news, we feel like we hear about the Constitution all the time. But I think it's worth stepping back in a moment like this, which is a, a moment of division and tension in American political life. And looking again at that charter of our government, because I think it actually has an enormous amount to offer us for understanding how a divided society can hold together in a challenging time. And so the book, on the one hand, is an attempt to help people just understand the Constitution better. On the other hand, it's also really an effort to help people understand the idea of national unity in a diverse society better. The, the first chapter of the book is called, What is the Constitution? The last chapter is called, What is Unity? And the book is really an effort to answer each of those questions by way of the other. Now, I think we should talk, let's start with talking about unity. Uh, and of course, we've recently talked about the Constitution with A.J. Jacobs in his Year of Living Constitutional. I know you heard that episode. Yeah, it was a wonderful book and a wonderful conversation. I uh, appreciate that. We'll put a link up to it. But this is in some sense a conversation of uh, in conversation with that episode, but in a very different way. Uh, let's talk about unity. Um, you know, I, I'm uh, I'm living in a country right now, Israel, that is in wartime. Uh, there's not that much unity here. There's <laughs> about a few things we'd like to get the hostages back, and we'd like to and uh, Hamas's role in governing Gaza. But there's a lot of disunity, and usually you'd think, well, wartime, everybody pulls together. Certainly in America right now, there's not much unity. So what does that mean in practical and in more importantly, I think, just cultural terms for the, for the country? You know, I think it's very important to ask that question because we do live with a kind of shorthand misunderstanding of unity that I think plays a big part in how we think about this moment in the United States, but in a lot of the democratic world. There's a sense, a kind of common sense view that what unity means is that we all agree, that we're of one view. Um, and that kind of unity is not generally a, a, a possible in a free society. And that's not just because modern societies are very diverse in the way we use that word now, that they're culturally diverse or people come from different understandings or religions or the rest of it. That's part of it, certainly. But there's also just the simple fact that free people are free to form their own opinions and they're going to form different opinions. And one of the striking things about the generation of Americans that wrote the Constitution of American leaders is how intensely aware they were of this. And so James Madison in, in Federalist 10, maybe his most famous writing about the Constitution in the effort to get it uh, ratified, says this amazing sentence, just bluntly. He says, as long as the reason of man continues fallible and he's at liberty to exercise it, different opinions will be formed. And I think any of us who have lived in a community with human beings know that's true. Even if we're working on something together, if we're part of one institution that has a clear purpose, you get 10 people together and what they're going to do is disagree about important things. And so the challenge is how can we be a unified society given that reality, given that we're going to be free? There's not a person here who's going to tell us all what to do. And so that means that we have to understand unity in a distinct way, which I think is 
deeply implicit in the American constitutional system. And that is to say that unity does not mean thinking alike. Unity means acting together. And it is not only possible, but necessary to act together when we don't think alike. And the question that that raises, the question, the simple question of how can we possibly act together when we don't think alike, is the question that the American Constitution means to answer. And I think it's really the question that any organized regime tries to answer. Given the fact of disagreement and the need for common action, how can we act together when we don't think alike? A society with a solid structure of institutions has a kind of clearly articulated way to tell itself how we go about this process. And a lot of what is most mysterious now to Americans and what is most frustrating to Americans about the Constitution is a function of the fact that it's an answer to that question, that it's intended to help us act together even when we don't think alike. But a lot of politics, I was going to say in America today, but of course it's true through most of of history at any democracy. It's certainly true here in Israel. There's a fear that the political process is a zero-sum game, that if the other side wins, we lose, and we lose in a particularly devastating way. I'll stick with the United States. I think there's a view in the United States that if the left wins, the United States will no longer be the United States. And if the right wins, the left's view is the United States will no longer be the United States. It'll be some some disgrace, some uh, failure of what should be its mission. And I often describe that as there's no longer a shared narrative. I don't know if that's a useful way to think about it. But when a country is divided and the each side sees the other side as effectively treasonous, it's very hard, one, to get anything done, which is part of what your book writes about. But it also means there's a cultural failure, it seems to me, and a political failure that go together, as you write about in the book. Do you think we've reached that point in the United States? And is, is, is your book, in some sense, a, an antidote to that disease? I, I do think that, in a sense, we've reached that point. I, I think that reaching that point, I think it's possible to recover from that kind of condition because our political tradition does give us a lot to work with on this front. So I would say that the sense that people have that the stakes are absolute is a function of a misunderstanding of how democracy works. And it's a misunderstanding that's rooted in the way that some democracies fail. Um, And the, the, the extraordinary thing about the American Constitution is how aware it is of that danger. So Democracy is rooted in the sense that majority rule is essential to political legitimacy. I think that is absolutely true. And the framers of the Constitution in the U.S. began from that premise. There is a democracy at the bottom of everything. Everybody is ultimately accountable to a voting public. And yet there is another fact about democracy, which is that majority rule can be very oppressive and that it creates a fear in minorities. Because if everything is up to the majority, and if whatever the majority does is deemed legitimate, then if you're not in the majority, you're in big trouble. And an election is a moment when a society decides who's in the majority and who's in the minority. And that means that if everything is up for grabs at every election, then the stakes are extremely high. And therefore, it really is a fight to the death. The American Constitution intentionally creates a a set of restraints on majorities, even as it empowers majorities. Now, it has to be said, this is actually what we find frustrating about the Constitution. And a lot of the critics of the Constitution are essentially majoritarians. And they say, look, a majority of the public voted for this party, and yet they can't get anything done because they have to negotiate with these other institutions and with the other party in the institution. And it's true. Everybody who wins an election for president or for Congress sooner or later in the U.S. finds himself saying, look, didn't I win the election? Why am I still dealing with these people? And the the reason you're still dealing with these people is that the Constitution is keenly aware that majorities have to be restrained before they are empowered, or at the very least, that in order to be genuinely legitimate, they have to be broad. 
and durable majorities and not narrow and fading or ephemeral majorities. So the system creates a bicameral legislature where the two houses are elected in two different ways. It creates these branches of government that are constantly in each other's way. Uh, it creates a, uh, an executive that's elected in a very peculiar way and has to constantly account uh, for himself to the Congress. All of these things are there to make sure that it's not simply the case that if you're in the minority, then you're screwed. That's not how American life should work. And in a way, the, the, the competing interacting majorities that the system creates is a way to make sure that everybody is in the minority sometimes, or at least can imagine themselves being in the minority, and therefore has to worry about how minorities are protected from majority power. And so how to balance majority power and minority rights is a challenge that every democracy has to face. I think the American Constitution is, is actually distinctly good at doing that. But that's also why it's so frustrating to narrow majorities, which are the only kind we've had in 21st century America. But this fear that everything's up for grabs, that, that um, fundamental issues surrounding the nature of the country are at stake seems to me comes from two forces. One force is the degradation of the Constitution, the inability of the Constitution in 2024 to restrain, I, I, I'm not sure it's majorities, but just the power of whoever's in office. Um, the second is, of course, the role of, of social media to en enrage and frighten people about what might be at, at stake. Of course, sometimes they're right. <laughs> those those frightened uh, voices or those enraging voices. But uh, those two things seem to me to be part, if not the large part of why we've reached this moment in America. Do you agree with that? I do. I, and I, I think that's part of why it's important to think, to, to become reacquainted with the fundamentals in a moment like this in our society. Um, because we have had a degradation of the constitutional system, an actual deformation of it in light of, a, of an alternative constitutional vision that's very frustrated with how the American system works. And we also have a culture that is, I would say, objectively mistaken about the stakes. So it's actually just not true that the next election is the most important in our lifetimes. It's not, that's not true. And it hasn't been true in 21st century America. The ironic thing about this period is that the, the sense people have of the stakes of our elections has increased and increased, even though we've lived in a period of very close elections, so that all the winners in the 21st century have been very restrained and constrained by the fact that their majorities have been very narrow. So I'll put it this way. I think the next election is important. It does put two differing visions and approaches to American life on the table. But whoever wins is going to win narrowly. And that means that whoever wins is going to have a hard time doing anything. And they're going to find it very frustrating that they can't do very much. But what it means that they can't do very much is that actually, in reality, the stakes of our elections are not absolute. The stakes of our elections are not nearly as high as we imagine. But we live in a moment of very, very narrow majorities that are persuaded that everything is at stake. I think that is a very broken political culture. Certainly, social media has a lot to do with that. I think, in general, the fragmentation of uh, American culture has a lot to do with that. Um, but we also have to face the fact that some of the reason for that has to do with the kind of frustration with our constitutional system that is unfounded, that is a result of our not understanding the purpose of that system and the structure of that system. And that's one reason to write a book like this in, in this moment. But it seems like there's a paradox, as you write in the book, and I think many people have, would agree, that the checks and balances of the Constitution restrain action. And one complaint, typically from the progressive side, is that can't get anything done in America. If only we were like China, where we you know, could just... It's a horrible thought in my mind. Um, yeah. but, but that complaint is we don't get anything done. My complaint which seems inconsistent with that claim is that too much gets done, <laughs> that, that too little is restrained. And, and maybe the, the way to resolve that paradox, I'll let you have a crack at it in a sec, but it seems to me the way to resolve that paradox is that certain fundamental institutional aspects of the Constitution are impossible, almost impossible to change. That, that there's a legislative branch, that there's a, a 
judicial branch, the executive branch. So all the action takes place in very narrow areas, how much is spent, tax rates, a few key issues. But the more adventurous things, uh, and, and there are very few restraints on those, on what can be done there, except through the, through the majorities and, and in the inst- given the institutions. But, but the other, the more bolder things that people would like to do are just not possible, but not actually because of the Constitution, but also because maybe just it's that narrow majority. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this does create a very peculiar kind of irony. So I, I would say that there has been a critique of the American system, at least since the middle of the 19th century, in some ways before that, that says – this system is not up to the challenge of modern life. It doesn't let government get enough done. That's what the progressive said in the immediate wake of the Civil War. It's the argument that Woodrow Wilson makes. And it's an argument that actually resulted in some real changes to the constitutional system in some, a few constitutional amendments um, for the income tax and how the Senate is elected. But more than that, to the emergence of the administrative state, which is a way to get more done through executive power um, and which I think in a lot of ways is hostile or at least foreign to the logic of the American constitutional system. And yet at the same time, we are alarmed at the divisions that, uh, that, that, that are now present in American political life. I think that the, the question of whether we're getting enough done depends upon our answer to a prior question, which is what are we trying to get done? And the American Constitution is actually distinct from most of the democracies in the world in the answer that it offers to that question. It's not like the European parliamentary systems, which are a model for the progressives. Those systems really do prioritize policy action. So if you win an election, you basically have all the power in the system until the next election or until you lose your majority in parliament. There are very few constraints on what a a ruling majority can do in the British system or in Israel or in most of the parliamentary systems. In the United States, that's never been the case. And what the Constitution is trying to produce is actually something more like a cohesive political culture. Its purpose is to facilitate greater unity in a divided society by broadening majorities before empowering them. And I think that it's true that the system now is not getting done what it's supposed to get done. But I think what it's supposed to get done is not what a lot of progressives think it's supposed to get done. So everybody agrees, for example, that Congress is failing in the United States now. It's in a very bad shape. But what is it failing to do? There's some people say it's failing to pass major legislation. I think it's failing to facilitate cross-partisan bargaining. That's its job. And we're so divided in our politics now because there's just not a lot of cross-partisan negotiation and bargaining. That can only happen in Congress. It's not happening there. So that progressive observer of Congress and I agree that Congress is failing. We don't agree about what it's failing to do. And it's actually very important that we first come to some sense of what we're, of, of what we're arguing about. Because if what it's failing to do is to pass major legislation then we need to remove some of the constraints on action in Congress to get rid of the filibuster, to make it easier for majorities to move. If what it's failing to do is facilitate bargaining and accommodation and deal making, then we actually need more of those kind of constraints. And then I would say the filibuster is the best thing about the contemporary Congress, which which I really believe it is. It's the only reason there's any deal making. So the question of what our system is trying to do is really where there is disagreement between progressive constitutionalists and conservative constitutionalists. And I think surfacing that question is very important because we often take it for granted and think we're arguing about the same thing, or even that we're agreeing. There's this little community of congressional reformers who all think Congress is failing, but we actually disagree very profoundly about what we're trying to achieve. And so to see the purpose of the system in this way can help us understand what has gone wrong and right in the American system. And I think a lot of the reason why we're at each other's throats now has to do with the fact that the progressive vision of the Constitution has advanced, has succeeded, rather than with the fact that there's this dispute between the progressive and the conservative vision. The other thing that that I think is true is that there are fewer and fewer moderates in either party. Uh, is that, which we don't have to talk about why that is, uh, that's interesting in of itself, but isn't that also a barrier to the kind of negotiation and bargaining and 
other ways that Congress can make progress in in passing legislation. It must be just harder because of the extreme extreme views on each side. I think that's true, but it's worth thinking about what we mean by moderate. So I think what we're lacking in our system now are temperamentally moderate politicians, people who are in politics in order to negotiate and who understand their job as negotiating on behalf of their constituents with representatives of people in America who think very differently from their constituents. A lot of American politicians have lost that sense that that's their job. And they think their job is to express the frustrations of their constituents and essentially stop there. And that means that the the institutions in our system that are meant to facilitate bargaining and accommodation are not functioning in that way. And again, Congress is really the central example here. Members think about Congress as a television studio, as a place to perform the frustrations of their voters. And that means that what we have in a divided politics is not a lot of people arguing with each other all the time. What you have are two camps of people, each of which only talks to itself about the other rather than talking to the other. And that makes the kind of politics that our system requires very, very difficult because that kind of politics requires constant ongoing negotiations. It's not just that You put two visions before the public, they vote for one, and that one then rules. There's a need for constant ongoing bargaining. And our system right now not only doesn't reward that kind of work, it punishes it. It treats a politician who wants to make a deal with the other side as though that person is weak, as though that person is betraying principle. Um, And that means that all the incentives that politicians confront make it very difficult for them to really do the work that our system requires of them. It's a big part of why that system is dysfunctional. I do think one way to understand that is to say there aren't enough moderates, but it's really, I would say there aren't enough people who think their job as politicians is to deal with people they disagree with. But isn't this a problem that extends way beyond the political sphere? Isn't it a problem in our friendships, in our social gatherings, in our colleges, uh, and maybe in our marriages. Um, you know, I just happened to notice a poll that shows that young men are increasingly seeing themselves on the right and young women are seeing themselves increasingly on the left. And um, if you don't like to engage intellectually with people who you don't agree with for co- in conversation and discourse, that's going to be a problem. It's definitely true. And I, I think we've seen this in American society in the 21st century in a very powerful way that we've, we've come to understand ourselves as divided in part because we've come to think that the only way to get anything done is to defeat the other side and make them go away. And a politics that assumes the other side even could go away, let alone that it should, is going to be dysfunctional. I think, again, this is why it's important for us to recognize that what unity looks like is not everybody agreeing. This kind of simple-minded idea that if only people stop disagreeing with me, then everything would be great. Sure, I believe that. If everybody agreed with me, I think the world would be a lot better. But you have to begin from the fact that that's not going to happen and then work your way toward a functional society. And that means that a functional society means looking for ways to act together even when we continue to disagree. I think we've stopped looking for those because, again, we're looking for some way to make all these damn people go away. Um, and that sure does extend beyond politics, no question about it. Uh, let's dig into some of the uh, ideas in the book, which are uh, some very unintuitive, some very novel, some uh, just provocative and interesting. Let's start with the role of competition uh, mm-hmm. in the Constitution. I think of politics as being a competitive process, but I tell I read your book, I didn't really think enough about how the Constitution builds it into so many different aspects of the political process and the legislative process. Yeah, absolutely. The, the Constitution has a couple of different modes of action that are just characteristic of everything that it does. And they're all directed in one way or another to helping us act together when we don't think alike. And the first of these, really, I would say, is competition. So that w- what you can do with groups of people or factions of, of Americans who disagree with each other is put them into competition. Competition means that they have to make themselves attractive. Um, They have to win converts or they have to win a dispute. 
they have to be the majority. They have to argue with each other in such a way that ultimately uh, people who are not sure will make a judgment in their favor, not against them. And in that sense, competition can be a powerfully moderating force in a divided society. Um, it, it forces people to put their best foot forward. And the Constitution does this in a, a wide variety of ways. I mean, the, the obvious one is there are elections and elections are competitive and the offices are filled that way. But there's also competition between the branches of our government, between the houses of Congress. The, the system protects the capacity for competition in the underlying society. So much of what the First Amendment protects through freedom of speech and through freedom of the press is actually about enabling competition in society. The idea that uh, th that Congress has the power to oversee uh, commerce in American society, what it's really protecting there is the capacity for a competitive economy that can facilitate trade and, and prosperity. There's just a sense underlying the system that competition is healthy for a free society in ways that are more than the obvious ways, that competition makes us better versions of ourselves, a very modern notion that I think is very important to how the American system operates. And another innovation, which I didn't appreciate, which is just extraordinary, uh, you write about when the Constitution was being written, quote, would the system empower the small states or the large ones? It would empower both and leave them ever struggling for balance. Would the president be a glorified clerk or an elevated head of state? He would be both and therefore neither. The few and the many, the city and the country, freedom and order, equality and excellence, representation and administrative efficiency to each of these stark choices, the Constitution says, yes, both. And as a result, it creates a regime, a democratic republic, that as the very term suggests, lives in constant tension with itself, yet is capable of extraordinary feats, end quote. What an interesting idea to see that failure to decide as a feature, not a bug. Yeah, it really, this is something that really stands out about the convention that produced the Constitution. So this convention was called because the system of government the Americans had after the Revolutionary War just wasn't working. Um, and it, it consisted of a really extraordinary collection of people. The states, actually because of competition, once Virginia announced who it was sending, a really high caliber group of people, all the states said, well, we got to send our best people. And that ended up being a convention of just extraordinary American leaders of that generation. And th there were fundamental questions about which they could not come to a simple agreement, very basic questions about the character of the system. And the convention over and over, and you find this in James Madison's notes of the convention, which are very thorough and really interesting and worth your while if you care about these things. Over and over, they, they decided to deal with difficult questions by containing them within the system. And so the, 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 maybe the most divisive question was the tension between the big states and the small states. And so would Congress give more power to states with bigger populations or equal power to all the states? They argued and argued and argued. And at the end of the day, the Connecticut delegation said, why don't we just, we're going to have two houses. Let's just answer yes to one group in one house and to the other group in the other house. And what that ends up meaning is that the tension between them continues to drive American politics. And all of the major decisions they made at the convention, one way or another, worked in this way. They couldn't quite decide on the role of the president. And so they gave him a role that is inherently contradictory. And rather than making things incoherent, that allows the system to shift its weight without losing its balance. There are times when we need a president who's very assertive, and, and leads the country through a difficult war. There are times when we need a president who says, my job is just to carry out the laws that Congress passed. And those are both correct ways of reading the, the president's role in the Constitution because the system has this kind of constructive tension inside of it. One of the things this means, and one of the frustrating things about this, is that sometimes there just is not a correct answer to a, a deep constitutional question. And, you know, these days we go to court looking for these answers and the court says one thing or another and half the country says that's wrong. But it's actually not oftentimes not exactly wrong. There are different emphases within the Constitution 
that can allow us to put the weight in different places at different moments in response to needs we have. And it's a tremendous strength of the system that it says yes and in places where it might have instead made a stark choice. It doesn't resolve every question. It creates a system in which the questions remain alive. You write a reasonable amount uh, in the book about the Electoral College, and it's a fantastic example of of what we're talking about. I think most people think it's an anachronism. It's just something that got, it's a perfect example for me of a Chesterton, Chesterton's fence, something that exists. You think, obviously, it, it, there's no reason for it. We'll just tear it down. And Chesterton said, be careful. You might want to think about why it was there in the first place because you don't understand the consequences of tearing it down. And Electoral College uh, seems to be grossly inferior to, to the popular vote. Why not just let the person with the most votes win? So what's the, first explain how the Electoral College works and why it might be worth keeping. Yeah, the Electoral College really is maybe the most peculiar institution created by the Constitution. And it's an answer to a difficult question that they face. The, the American Constitutional Convention had to create a Republican national executive, that is a, a, a democratically elected uh, executive who would have enormous power, power that was like the power of a king in the European societies of the 18th century, but who would be accountable to the public and even to Congress in some ways. And there was really no model for how to do this. The, the, the states had governors and they were all dissatisfied with how their governors operated. They, didn't, they had models of what not to do there. And the question was really, how do you establish this executive? The hardest question was, how do you elect the executive? To whom should he be accountable? There was a strong argument made by many of the, of the best minds at the convention that the president should be chosen by Congress. Um, and that is really, that's how prime ministers and parliamentary systems are chosen. It's a kind of second tier uh, democratic election. But there was great concern, especially by James Madison, that you don't want to make the executive too dependent on Congress. Congress was the democratic branch. It would be subject to majority whims. And you wanted the executive to be a little bit removed from that. Um, and so how, how can you do that but, but still have a democratic executive? The other concern about making the president not too dependent on the public meant that they didn't want to elect the president directly by just having a direct popular vote for a national executive. Their fear was this would result in demagogues. Somebody who can just move the public with him is not actually the kind of person that you necessarily want uh, as, as an executive. And so they created an indirect mechanism for electing the president that works through the states. The way American presidential elections work is the voters vote and whoever wins a majority in each state um, then gets the electoral votes of that state. The number of electoral votes is based on the population of the state by a very simple formula. It's just the number of members of Congress that state has is the number of electors it has. And those electors actually meet in person in each state. Um, the, the idea at the convention was maybe they would even confer. They would talk to each other about who would be the best choice. That never really happened, even from the very beginning. They voted the way their state voted. But what it meant was that the, the American president is elected through a series of state-based democratic elections so that the issues that matter in the different states would matter in presidential elections. And very importantly, what we have found in, in, in modern times in America, and the reason why I think the Electoral College is actually especially useful in a divided time, is that it forces the election to take place in those states that are divided. So if, if we had just a popular vote, the parties would focus where they're strongest. The Democrats would get every last Democrat in California out to vote. Republicans would get every last Republican in the Deep South out to vote. And the Democrat would run in California and the Republican would run in the South and they would not be talking to each other. But because of the Electoral College, everybody has to win Miss Michigan, Pennsylvania, Georgia, states that could go either way. And that means that our presidential candidates have to talk to the middle of the country. The only way to win is to talk to the middle of the country. You can be as strong as you want in Texas as a Republican. If you didn't win Michigan, you didn't win the election. And that actually forces our politics to be less polarized, less partisan uh, than they otherwise would be. One other thing I'd say about the Electoral College is the, the complaint that's often made about it 
is that it's not democratic enough. And people point to all kinds of comparative examples. But actually, the way that parliamentary systems choose the chief executive is less democratic than the Electoral College, not more. Right. The British, for example, have had three prime ministers since the last election. How are those people chosen? They were chosen by the parliamentary party. They were chosen by 250 people who all went to the same university. That is not better than the Electoral College from a democratic point of view. Th they're trying to deal with this same problem. There's a real danger in having a direct popular election for the chief executive. And the United States is by no means the only system that worries about this. It worries about it by a, a, a convoluted, complicated system. But I think it's a system that's actually served us much better than a lot of Americans are aware of. And well, you point out that all the action takes place in so-called swing states. Uh, people who live in California, New York, Texas, Florida complain, well, but they don't pay any attention to me, missing the reality that, well, but you get a lot of seats in the Congress because right. you're really big. Uh, and and. The flip side is, is that if it was only popular vote, uh, states like Wyoming, Rhode Island, Connecticut, it's a long list, would get no attention whatsoever. And there's an inherent tension. And of course, as you point out, we get both. Both, both small and large states have different aspects of power within this interlocking system. Exactly right. And, and there, is this, there is this logic in the American system in general that tries to have a regional balance. There was a worry at the convention that the big states would always get the most attention and that states with a concentrated population, states with big cities, would be likely to be culturally dominant and economically dominant. And so the Senate, too, is built in this way, that Wyoming has the same number of senators as California. Obviously, that is not representative in a simply democratic way. But it's rooted in the in the sense, in the fear that California is just bound to be more influential in American life than Wyoming. And there needs to be some balance there. And I think that, too, the structure of the Senate and the Electoral College has served us well in this way at different moments in American life when debates between the big states and the small states, which we now think of as cultural debates because the small states tend to be more conservative, but they've been economic debates between farm and city. They've been debates about land policy, all kinds of things where New York and California would have just run over the rest of the country if we had a simply democratic system. And the fact that we let this regionalism matter is a, a great strength of the American system. I want to leave the Electoral College with a quote, very well said, that you, you have in the book. Uh, you write, quote, the national vote total in an election in which the outcome is decided by the Electoral College amounts to an answer to a question that voters were not asked. It's an incidental byproduct of the actual election and does not describe an actually existing electorate and so does not tell us more about public opinion than the official result of the presidential election. An election structured differently would produce a different electorate. And to quote, you know, as an economist, I always say, well, you know, if you're trying to win the electoral college, the incentives push you to do a certain set of things, you don't care about the national vote total. It's irrelevant. Uh, and yet, when it does not match, which, of course, it has a handful of times, it makes people feel like there's been a violation, as if the wrong candidate was chosen. But, of course, had the rules of the game been different, the players would have played it differently, and a different set of things would have happened, and you can't compare the two, and you, you say it very well. It's exactly right. You know, the, I, I think of this as a, as a political scientist, but getting at the same question, there's this very counterintuitive fact about democracy, which is that majorities are actually created by electoral systems. There's not just some thing out there as public opinion. People don't just walk around with a view about who should be their senator. There first has to be such an office created, and then there's a political system around it and a party system. And as a result of all of that, you end up with an organized majority and minority in an election. That majority is a product of the political system. And that means that if we had a different system, we would have a different majority. And so to say we had an election under one system, but the, the, the greater number of people voted for the other person, well, that actually doesn't tell you what you think it tells you. That is not a, a fact about American public opinion. Um, and, and if we organized our elections, as you say, around a popular vote, everybody would run in a very different way. And who knows? 
I mean, I often point out to people, the closest thing we have to a popular national vote is the popular vote for the House of Representatives. And in the last, since 1995, and what we think of as the modern era in Congress, Republicans have won the popular vote for the House 11 times out of 15 elections. And so, and they've even won it in years when the Democrat won the, the so-called popular vote in the presidential election. We're just asking people different questions. And we have to recognize that the answer they give us to one question doesn't necessarily tell us how they would have answered a very different question. It's a very hard fact to get your head around in a democracy. Uh, in the West, democracy is uh, until fairly recently been romanticized and revered. Uh, it's under attack uh, to some extent in many, many parts of the democratic world. But I think it's important to remind listeners, uh, it's, it's a controversial statement that uh, the United States is a very particular kind of democracy. And most people associate democracy, which is the rule of the people, with majority rule. I mean, what could be more than the rule of the people, than majority rule? And yet that is not the United States system. The United States is a republic, a particular kind of democracy where the will of the people is expressed in very complex ways, as we've been discussing. Uh, do you want to add anything to that? Because I want to read a quote yeah, to you I, about, of yours. I, I, th I would describe the American system as mitigated majority rule. And the reason it's mitigated is that majority rule is a dangerous thing. The, the, and it's, it's, it's hard for politicians to say this to democratic majorities, but the American system is definitely built on the insight that majorities can be oppressive of minorities. You can't look at American history and not see that that is obviously true in a society where by majority vote, part of our society enslaved another part of our society for 120 years. So majorities can be very dangerous. The, the, the generation that wrote the Constitution was uniquely aware of this because in the 10 years after the American Revolution, the, the American government was very chaotic and did not work well. And the reason was that it was too radically democratic. The states all had elections every year for their legislature. These legislatures had enormous power and it was out of control. And so the Constitution was written in a very odd moment when there was an unusual awareness of the costs of majority rule, even as there was a commitment to the legitimacy of majority rule, I think we've been very well served by the fact that it was written in that moment so that we get the best of both. We do get majority rule, but we also get restraints that force majorities to grow, to build coalitions in ways that make them more legitimate. Yeah, I'm going to try to reset something I said earlier that was, I think was pretty incoherent. I may not do better this time, but what restrains the majority in American politics are two things, the necessity of complying with the rules of the Constitution and how legislation gets passed, vetted, signed, and so on, or vetoed, and the Constitution itself, which puts certain things out of bounds. Uh, what I was trying to say earlier was I think what's out of bounds these days has, has gotten uh, very very little is out of bounds. Yeah. Uh, and so it's the gridlock of the system, which is still part of the Constitution, but it's not the uh, what was restraining governmental power in, say, the 19th century. Yeah, that's With right. With the exception and, and, of slavery, which is obviously a dramatic case. I'm thinking more in terms of economic policy regulation and so on. I think an especially important part of that is American federalism, which put a lot of things beyond the reach of the national government. Uh, most of what government does was assigned to the states to begin with and has gradually been overtaken by national power. And especially because the, the role of the national government in regulating interstate commerce has come to be understood as involving everything. Everything is interstate commerce and therefore the limits that exist on government power have really been degraded over time. I think there's no question that that's part of the reason why our system now has trouble doing its job. So here's a quote from you about republicanism, this particularly uh, American uh, version of it. Uh, it's a beautiful quote. You say the following. Republicanism presumes a set of core virtues and ideals that must hold a society together. At the heart of modern republicanism is an idea of the human being and citizen rooted in the highest traditions of the West, that we are each fallen and imperfect yet made in a divine image and possessed of equal dignity, that individuals are social creatures meant to live together, that living together 
requires a commitment to pursue the common good, and that this pursuit in a free and therefore diverse society requires of the citizen selflessness, accommodation, restraint, deliberation, and service. These commitments still leave enormous room for disagreement, though not infinite room. Close quote. It's a lovely quote. I think if we did a poll, Yuval yes. Levin would be one of the supporters of it, but I don't know how many more there would be, Yuval. That's a very, um, I would say, unpopular view, both of, of human beings and what our role should be in, in, in our country. Do you, um, do you agree with that? Yeah, unfortunately, I, I do agree with that. I, I, I think that, um, I, I, or I'd put it this way, I think that that kind of view is a precondition for a liberal society, but is not created by liberal institutions alone. And it's why our free societies require institutions that are pre-modern, in a sense, that teach us that kind of vision, the family, religion, certain kinds of educational institutions and cultural institutions. The American system of government does protect those institutions. Uh, I think if you look at what the First Amendment protects, for example, it's actually those kinds of institutions. It protects religion. Uh, it protects the spaces in which education can happen freely and in which people can make different choices for themselves and their families. But the assumption is that if you protect that space, those institutions will fill that space and shape people in the way that you just described. And I think part of the problem we confront in contemporary uh, American life, but not only in America, is that that doesn't happen by itself. That takes real work, and it takes an actual commitment to that kind of vision, which is, I would say, a traditional vision, um, and, and so requires a, a traditional uh, approach to modern life. That's hard to hold together. It is a challenge. And yeah, if we took a vote on all those things, uh, I'm not sure I'd like how uh, it would turn out. Now, I would say if you took a vote on the Bill of Rights, I'm not sure it would pass in contemporary America. Free speech, freedom of religion. Uh, I'm very glad we have them and that they're kept out of the reach of majorities because I am not at all sure what majorities would do if we asked. I'm with you there. Um, you make a claim in the book that I think is rather uh, extraordinary. And no one else that I read talks about it, which is, and you alluded to it a little bit in, in those, in what you just said, that our political institutions, and in particular the Constitution, shapes the character of the citizens. Make that case. It's a, it's a, it, it's a very, um, it's a bold claim. Yeah, this is a, this is a classical case. That is, it uh, it begins with Aristotle, at least um, the notion that the kind of regime you live under has to do with the kind of human being you are, and I think you find it expressed in the modern world in in something like national character. Right, there is such a thing as an American in the world. It's hard to see when you're in the United States, but when you're not in the United States and you encounter an American somewhere, you can tell real quick that this person is an American and. Part of what that has to do with, I think, is a set of assumptions and expectations and attitudes that are not that are not separate from our political culture. And maybe especially in the United States, the Constitution is just part of who we are. I mean, kids arguing in the schoolyard will talk about free speech. And I don't know where they learned about it, but they know that they have certain kinds of rights that they uh, you know, that that that, uh, that 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 they can sign a petition, that they can do all these kinds of things that are actually real social achievements of our constitutional order that we take for granted because we live under that order and we are shaped by it. And I think every society's national character uh, has to do at some level with the kind of political constitution that it has, and the American national character uh, assumes a level of independence and assumes uh, an idea of rights and of, uh, and, and of the uh, equality of individuals that has a lot to do with our political tradition. It shapes us in ways that we often don't recognize, but that we can't escape, and that I think in most respects are, are good for us. Yeah, we talked earlier about competition. I think Americans, uh, there's other reasons than just the Constitution, of course, but they... Americans, I think, in general, have a faith in competition relative to, say, elites making decisions for, uh, for the masses, and in particular, competition combined with accountability. Mm -hmm. And even though it's fashionable among economists to bemoan the lack of understanding 
that the general public has about economics. I think one thing that is absorbed in American culture is the role incentives play when combined with competition and accountability. And you just don't see it in in other places in the way you see it in the United States, it seems yeah. to me. I think that's really true. And, and you also see this with respect to the very fact of structures for, uh, for, for decision-making. You know, Tocqueville jokes in the 1830s that when you get three Americans together, they'll elect a treasurer. And I, I think that there's still some truth to that. We just have a way of thinking about how we act together that emphasizes procedure. And that, too, is a function of our constitutional heritage. Yeah, I'm just thinking here in Israel, we had before this terrible, uh, the terrible events of October 7th and, and their aftermath, we were in the middle of an enormous crisis over judicial reform. And one of the aspects of judicial reform was to change the way that Supreme Court justices in Israel were chosen. And it was to take it away from uh, basically the equivalent of, say, the American Bar Association and previous justices. That's the way they're chosen here. And to put the, the choices in the hands of politicians. Some of my British friends were so horrified by that idea, the idea that a politician would know who to choose to, for a judge. And, of course, I'm thinking as an American, but then at least they have to face the voters, whereas right. that other group can do whatever it wants. More or less, I mean, there's social pressure on them, of course, but the, just that mindset uh, is so totally different depending on the system you're used to. Yeah, it runs very deep, and we just take it for granted. Uh, cover of this week's Economist uh, is America dictator proof. What are your thoughts on that? Are you worried about the uh, stability of the American political system? Well, yes, I think it's, it makes sense to worry about the stability of our system uh, in the 21st century, but I'm not, um, I'm not panicked about the stability of our system. I think we are living in a moment with very low quality politicians in America and that the system has to do with why that is, the kinds of incentives that it creates, the kind of people that it invites in. I think of that as a product less of the constitutional system than of certain kinds of deformations of it, uh, party primaries and the ways in which we've over-empowered our presidents. But I do think that that creates some real dangers. On the other hand, the United States has very strong institutions. Um, it, one thing it does have over other democracies is the simple fact that we have had this fairly stable system of government uh, for a very long time. And things like respect for court decisions, um, and for the timing and structure of elections, for all that we can worry about them, and there have been some reasons to worry about them, um, actually do run very, very deep in our system. It's, it's one important thing to recognize from looking at the Constitution. Americans like to think of our country as very young, and, um, and, and like we're still getting started. The United States is the oldest of the existing democracies in the modern world. The British have a kind of claim. They can say they have the same institutions they did uh, in 1800, but none of those institutions do the same thing they did in 1800. The United States really does. Um, you know, w w when I was young, I, I worked as a congressional staffer. And I used to give tours of the Capitol, and you'd start those by saying the Capitol building opened its doors in December of 1800 to house the U.S. Congress, which it still houses today. In 2024, it's the same institution, does the same work in the same system. That's a really extraordinary fact. And our system has survived moments of instability much more profound than this one, including, of course, a civil war. But even apart from that, um, so it makes sense to worry about this moment, but this is not the most dangerous moment it has faced. And I think our system has shown itself to be quite durable, even in this period. Let's go back to the thing we opened with, which is unity. Um, when the United States was established, there were enormous divisions of industrial versus agricultural, economic activity, small states, large states, and so on. It's, it's really quite extraordinary that, that there was a uh, constitution that was passed and that the Confederation became the United States. A lot of people suggested that was then, this is now. Uh, we have different kinds of enormous differences across geographic parts of the United States. Um, 
maybe it's time for the United States to be smaller, uh, to be more than one country, uh, to be more, you know, at the same time, of course, Europe's heading in the other direction, becoming more unified or trying to, to be confederated. But a lot of people suggest that the United States should split off. The South is really different from the Northeast. The West is different from everything else. California should probably be its own country by itself. And that the one way, the way you get unity is to secede, but not over a horrible institution like slavery, but rather a respectful separation in the way a divorce, an amicable divorce. Uh, do you see that in America's future? So, you know, I, I think about this in a peculiar way. I, I'm, I'm an immigrant. I came to the United States as a kid. So I grew up here, but, um, but I am an immigrant and uh, from Israel. And looking at the United States with a little bit of an outsider's eye, especially when I was younger, the idea that Californians and Texans are so different that they can't be one country is just crazy. Californians and Texans are obviously both Americans. They're so American. Even the way they think about how different they are is so American that they're 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 so they're both so different from even Canadians, um, let alone uh, the kinds of differences that sometimes characterize different European societies or Latin Americans. We are obviously one country, and the experiment that was begun in the in the late 18th century to create one people uh, clearly succeeded. Now, there are divisions. There are cultural and political divisions. There always have been. Some of them are sharper now than they've been. There's also more diversity of different kinds now than we've often had in American history. There's more cultural diversity. Um, but the United States clearly has a defining vision of itself. It clearly has a sense of who it is that's deeply rooted in its own history. I think w we too easily uh, we too easily take the down view of the condition of American life. There are certainly real problems here, but actually underlying those deep divisions, the strength of the American character is quite strong. And I don't think that ultimately when it comes down to it, it would make any sense for any of those kinds of divisions of the country that people talk about to actually happen. The, the, the country wouldn't want to live without California. There are certainly times when I wish we could live without California. They do crazy things over there. But California is really dynamic and interesting and forward looking. And I think Texas needs California and vice versa. So to my mind, the idea that uh, we're on the verge of another civil war or that we should be divided um, is a little nuts. So I usually like to end on an optimistic note. That was an optimistic note, but I'm going to add a pessimistic note, coming back to something you said earlier about you're not so worried about the state of things. Um, one of the remarkable aspects of this 200-plus year thing called the American Republic is the peaceful transition of power. Uh, I don't think it's ex very explicitly written about that transition. There has been, I would say, until very recently in, in Donald Trump's loss to uh, Joe Biden, until then, presidents may have resented the electorate's choice. They may have felt they were cheated, as I think Richard Nixon felt legitimately in 1960, that that election was literally stolen, and there's quite a bit of evidence on that. But in 2024, uh, what I'm worried about is the ability of a candidate who has lost to refuse to leave, uh, or 2028, depending on when it happens, and is able to convince via social media, as Donald Trump convinced a lot of people that he was the, the actual winner, when as far as I know, I don't think there's a lot of evidence for that. Mm -hmm. And yet he persisted and probably will persist in arguing that he won that election. He did leave office. <laughs> uh, he did vacate the White House, but one of the things I worry greatly about, and it's related to your uh, previous book and previous uh, Time to Build and the conversation that we had around that, is that a lot of norms not written down, not in the Constitution, not in the, uh, in the Bill of Rights, a lot of norms have, have eroded over time about what one's obligations are. And many of them are unspoken, unwritten, and yet they're observed. And if those norms continue to erode, I worry greatly about the future of America. 
I do too. I, I think that is the one place where it is reasonable in this moment to be very alarmed about the condition of the system. And I actually think that that is also a reason to go back to the beginning and to remind people of why these things are here. You mentioned Chesterton's fence before. I think it's a very useful way to think about a lot of what is in our system, which is you have to understand why it's there before you decide it's time to get rid of it. Now, you might still decide that, but you have to be able to explain to yourself why we have it. And I think that that's now the case with a lot of our constitutional system, that we have to remind ourselves or to reacquaint ourselves or maybe to acquaint ourselves for the first time with the underlying logic here, which comes from a place of worry about democratic political culture. The Constitution was written by people who were not sure this could work. And we should always have somewhere in the back of our minds a, a concern and unsureness about whether this can work. And that should lead us to restraint. It should lead us in some in really crucial moments to prefer social peace over winning the argument, to recognize that the alternative to our winning uh, is not necessarily the, uh, the, 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 the alternative to the system we have is not our winning. The alternative to the system we have is a collapse of social peace in American life. And we take it for granted because we've always been able to count on it, or almost always, but it is not to be taken for granted. We should prioritize cohesion. We should prioritize social peace much more than we do and recognize that pushing these boundaries runs real risks. And one way to see that is to help ourselves understand why the boundaries are there, why they look the way they do, so this book is in part certainly rooted in that kind of concern, not just in a sense of confidence about the American system, but in some worry about whether it can persist if we forget why it's there and why it is the way it is. My guest today has been Yuval Levin. His book is American Covenant. Yuval, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you so much, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday. <laughs>